Hi, welcome to Fiverr Chats. My name is Irina. I'm the host here and my guest today is Anna Campus from uh, Circles Teachers. Hi, Anna. Hi, thanks for having me. You're welcome. I'm glad you are one of my guests today. Um, so we've met at Rhinebeck briefly. Um, what's Rhinebeck for you? Like, do you go there to get new inspiration for yarn dyeing? Do you go to see what's in what's coming is that just a social hangout for you ah a bit of all of the above uh you know Rhinebeck for me is sort of one of the few industry related events where I go and I don't work so that's a nice you know break for me so it's definitely a chance to catch up with friends and meet new people um, but I'm also going to you know see what's new and what's exciting and what new people I might be interested in partnering with. Of course, it's always be like great to see all the, you know, all the projects that are out and about and see what people have been really excited about all year. And, you know, I definitely come out of it with dying inspiration too. So it's just, you know, it's just great all around. Well, let's go a little bit back. How did you decide to start with the store? Like, how did that happen? So the store is sort of one step in a really long, you know, fiber related journey. So I actually started with just me selling hand knit pieces is what I was doing at craft fairs. And that was in, I think like 2008, 2009, um, because I was knitting a lot and I just had, you know, all these extra things and I was creating my own really simple patterns. And then I realized that I'm not actually good at selling people hand knits. Like I understand knitters, but I don't, I'm not really so good at the like selling fashion side of it. And so then I transitioned from selling finished knits to designing patterns. And then I started dyeing my own yarn and I started dyeing yarn, I think in 2011 uh, under my label Toil and Trouble. And then in 2015, I opened my shop Circle of Stitches. So I've kind of done a little bit of everything and kind of still do. Right. Well, do you feel like because you've done a little bit of everything, it helps you in running the store? Um, yes and no. Yes, in that I sort of understand the industry from many different angles. You know, I, I, I do design, so I understand what it's like to be on the pattern designer side of things. I wholesale my yarn, and so I know what it's like to be like the vendor in you know, the retail relationship. And now having my store, I understand what it's like to be on the store end of it. Um, but it also means that I never have enough time to do everything that I want to do because there's too many things. And so that makes things a little complicated. Right. Well, let's talk about the witching part of that. So where did, is that just because it's in Salem or is there more to that? There is more to it. So I grew up with an aunt who does, um, who is a professional tarot reader and is an astrologer. So I grew up around it. So I've been exposed to, you know, tarot and crystals and that kind of stuff for as long as I've been exposed to knitting, right? Because all started in my childhood and they were both things that I was, you know, passionate about. But funny enough, you know, I moved to Salem because I very much enjoy having the mix of that in my life. But when I first opened my store, I was like, oh, well, those things can never mix, which is funny because, you know, the shop, my shop name is Circle of Stitches, which is a play on Circle of Witches. And that is because we're in Salem. But when I first started, you know, it was just like strictly yarn shop because I figured like, I don't want to scare people right. with this other stuff. And then I got to a point where I realized like, well, it's my store and I didn't leave a corporate job to not do what I want. You know, so I just kind of tried. I started offering tarot classes first and, um, you know, we did get a little bit of pushback from some folks, but most folks loved it and they kept asking for more. So then I started um, supporting indie deck creators, you know, in the same way that I like supporting indie yarn dyers. There's people who are creating their own decks and independently publishing them. And so that was a way for me to just sort of work with more independent creators. And it's just kind of grown together nicely, which was a really pleasant surprise because I kind of just figured I'd try it and see what happens. So how do you decide who you're going to hire? Because... Like, do they have to be tarot reading witches to be hired in your store? Um, no. Um, so funny enough, I actually do have um, one employee, Kathy, who is an excellent knitter and also is the tarot reader and tarot teacher, but that's purely coincidental. 
uh, you know, when I'm hiring staff for the store, I'm definitely looking for people who have a lot of knitting experience and that expertise. And when, you know, when, when they're speaking to people about the tarot decks, I'm more educating them about the, you know, the deck creator and more about that background. I don't expect them to necessarily know anything about tarot, but, you know, you kind of, you learn more about things just kind of being in the environment and hearing about it. But I'm definitely, you know, I'm definitely focusing on hiring folks who are, you know, very experienced knitters. I'm not so much focusing on the other side of it. Right. So besides just selling yarn, you also dyeing yarn. Uh, yes. What's the inspiration for your colors? How do you find those inspirations? Well, one thing that I realized, you know, I live in New England and um, every area really kind of has color schemes that they prefer. So you'd think that colors that do really well, you know, in one area would do well everywhere. And that's definitely not true. Color preference is definitely very regional. And my color sense, having grown up in Brazil, is very different than a native New Englander. You know, we've just had sort of different experiences of the natural environment. And so a lot of my color inspiration comes from my background. And um, I know that I cre end up creating colors that people find very different, at least in New England, because my color sense is, is very different. And that tends to be what attracts folks. But I definitely take a lot of uh, inspiration from, you know, the natural landscape in Brazil and my background there. Um, I you know, love crystals and gemstones, you know, because a lot of them come from Brazil. So I grew up around them. So a lot of those colors inspire me too. Um, and I admit, I don't find quite as much inspiration around New England just because it's, you know, it doesn't feel like my space in the same way that Brazil does. So when you started to knit, like you said, you learned as a child. When people come to you now, is it harder for you to teach them how to knit or is it easier because it's like just part of your life and it always been with you? Um, I, I guess I can say that I get very good feedback as a teacher. So people seem to be happy with me as a teacher. So that's good. But the interesting thing, uh, I guess, as far as how I think my brain works, I actually work, uh, worked as an architect before I quit to uh, open my store. And I started thinking about knitting in a very structural way when I was in my last year of architecture school and I was writing my master's thesis and I started working, uh, writing about the structure of knitting and how it comes together. And so I've spent a lot of time sort of analyzing how the fabric is made and taking it apart and putting it back together. Like, can I insert it? Like, can I drop stitches and insert cables? And, you know, and just really playing with it and understanding how it comes together. And I think that that has helped me be able to sort of help all skills of knitters. Like I've honestly never had someone come into my store with a problem that I couldn't fix because I have, I feel very comfortable with the structure of knitting. And because I approach it in that way, like for example, um, you know, the rhyme that we use for Kitchener Stitch is one of my least favorite things ever because it's not teaching people how to read their knitting, right? It's just teaching you a rhyme. And if you're off by half a stitch or like it just, it's not going to work. And so I, I think I've developed a lot of different ways of sort of showing people how to do something and how to explain it because I'm not relying on, you know, like those sort of formulas for things. So I think that that definitely helps me, but I will admit that I am a better teacher to folks who already know how to knit and want to gain more experience than with complete beginners. How many classes does the uh, store offer? Like, is that the big part of the store? It is. I mean, since the pandemic started, we haven't been doing in-person workshops. We just started doing our intro to knitting workshops again. So most of our offerings right now are online, but that's a big part of what I do is trying to do, you know, education for knitters. So we cover honestly pretty much every topic, you know, we'll do, you know, like we have a sock class coming up, but we do socks, finishing, steaking, you know, brioche from beginner to advanced, um, sweater fitting, um, you know, so Basically, I'm constantly trying to figure out what are techniques that can help knitters grow and building classes around that. And since my, you know, sort of my area of, of expertise really is sort of that more structural technical aspect, I think it allows me to offer a lot as, as far as, you know, workshop offerings. Do you remember like in the beginning, like when you were younger, what were you knitting? Like when did you became an expert? Um, well, so 
you know, I sort of knit it and crocheted on and off for most of my life. I didn't get serious about it until I was in graduate school because I was using it to, you know, manage the, the stress of being in grad school for architecture. Um, but the, re the way that it started is, if you remember in the 90s, there was this time when there was a, a trend of those sweaters that were like crochet mesh with like, you know, like they just look like lattices. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, mom, I really want one of those. And she said, well, and I don't know why she said this because she doesn't really knit or crochet. So I don't know why she had this idea, but she's like, well, instead of buying you one, you can crochet yourself one. And so, and so that's how it started. I never actually made one for myself, but I made them for like all my stuffed toys. <laughs> um, and, you know, I sort of had that relationship on and off. And it's funny because now I understand that not everyone who, and I say this like with utmost respect, but not everyone who knits should be teaching knitting. Not everyone who can do it necessarily has the skills to teach someone else that skill. And so I sort of learned how to knit several times in my life from people who weren't great teachers, <laughs> you know? And so I was 18 when it really, really stuck for me. And then I, you know, I was in grad school in my early twenties and that's when I really got serious about it. And, you know, in Brazil, the, the availability of resources is very different from, you know, the US. Um, history is just not written in the same way, documented in the same way, and knitting and crochet are still very much an oral tradition. So I didn't know that I could go find patterns that had already been written where all the work had been done for me. And so my knitting education um, was very much, you know, a close friend of mine who I, I'm still friends with is the one who I say properly taught me how to knit and her, technique was basically, you know, make a square, measure it, and then just figure out how many stitches you need to make whatever you want. And it was always just that, like, you have to figure it out. And so I didn't know that there were all these resources. So I spent a lot of time, um, you know, like inventing my own decreases. Like I didn't know that I could just look up an SSK, like I backed my way into it. So I kind of did all this extra work that I didn't need to do. Right. Um, so when did you start learning? Like now you're teaching all these techniques. Like when did yeah. you start learning the techniques? Or was it all part of figuring it yeah, out? Yeah, it was all part of that, you know, because I figured a lot of it out for myself. Um, and then I started realizing that I, yeah, I'm lucky that my brain sort of works in that way with structure and not everyone's does. And so I've just sort of worked on figuring out, you know, where are the places where people struggle and what techniques sort of grow to go together and how can I turn that into you know, a class curriculum that's useful. Right. So you mentioned that you were knitting for like mental health and comfort, meditating sort of during the grad school. What's yeah. knitting for you now? Like, has it ever become knitting or the yarn store, right? Has it ever become source of stress? I mean, yes, always, because running a small business is super stressful. I think no matter what, um, but the fact that my small business is built around something that I'm really passionate about, I think makes all the difference because, you know, I, I knit for work, but it's never reached a point where I don't like knitting for myself anymore. And so I don't, I guess I don't think it's stressful in a way that, um, how do I say this? I think that there's no way to run a small business without it being stressful. So <laughs> I don't blame the knitting for it, you know? Right. How do you decide what yarn you're gonna stock? That's always a tough one. And, you know, my yarn has, my yarn, my store has a lot more yarn now than it did when I first opened. And I'm kind of at a point where we don't have any more room for new yarn. So it's, con you know, I'm constantly having to decide like, which ones do I let go, which ones come in. And so I try to be mindful to have, um, yarn that sort of covers like sort of all the necessities, you know, all the weights. Um, and I try to have something that is for everyone. I definitely want folks who have a tighter budget to have some options, but I'm definitely focused more on smaller companies and higher quality yarns. And so I look at obviously first and foremost, you know, do I like the yarn? Is it a yarn that I would be happy to offer to people? Um, the, but then I also look at, you know, where is the yarn produced, who is it produced by, and what are the values of that company, because that's really important to me, right, to make sure that 
I am supporting other makers whose values I can support. Uh, you know, like for example, I work with Harrisville Designs. They're, you know, a small mill. They're a two hour drive from here. I can literally drive over there and talk to the owners. I can see the yarn being made. And, you know, I know that they're good people that I feel happy supporting. And so that's really important to me to, to work with vendors that I can have good relationships with and know that I'm, you know, supporting good people. And that makes all the difference to me. Right. Are there like companies that just invoke that you want their yarn to be in your store? Uh, well, so the big one that we just got, and I, you know, it took me a couple of years to get that was La Bien Aimée, which I'm super excited about that we just got. And I'd wanted Wolf Folk, which we just managed to get in as well. And that took me a couple of years. So I've, I'm at a point where I'm kind of getting the ones that I've been sort of long-term hoping for. And now I'm sort of working on figuring out like who are the next people that I'm interested in. And there's actually someone at uh, Rhinebeck who I'm a huge fan of, and I'm going to be touching base with them finally, because now they're finally offering wholesale. So there'll be some new things coming. And, you know, that's part of the journey is constantly trying to figure out who's doing what that's exciting and, you know, with good people behind it. Right. So like a lot of uh, yarn stores that I know, they sort of like go after the hip and popular designers, right? The whatever, your top 10 of Ravelry. And then they organize kits. Like, do you do that as well? Do you try to see like what designs are super popular on Ravelry and then try to create kits for that? Oh yeah, I've definitely done a lot of that. I created a lot of kits for, you know, the shift cowl, the Andrea Mari design, because I have spin cycle, uh, you know, but Andrea is someone who was really nice and supportive to us during the pandemic and did a lot to support us. So I'm happy to support her back. And so I definitely try and keep an eye on things that are popular right now, but I will admit that even if it's popular, if I don't like it, then I don't tend to do it because you know, when I was first starting my business, someone gave me this advice that said, you know, buy inventory that's 30% ugly. And by ugly, they meant 30% that you don't like. And I don't do that because if I don't like it, I'm not excited about it. And I've decided that, you know, it's okay. I can't make everyone happy. And so I definitely try and see, you know, what is popular, what people are excited about, but I also try and make sure that it's something that I'm excited about as well. But I do also try and create things that are more unique to us. Like right now we're doing a knit along with one of my shawl designs, Navaska, that just came out. I wish I had it here to show you. I don't, I have you know, the swatch that I was making for it back here. Uh, so that's a design you know, that I created and we're doing a knit along you know, at the store. And so I try to have things that are uh, you know, perhaps popular and more widely known, but I also try and have things that are special and different so that we're not just doing the same thing as everyone else. Do you ever try to support like small, just coming out designers that you meet? Yeah, I, so I actually have people send me emails all the time, you know, telling me that they're a new designer and here's a new design that they came out with. And if there's anyone listening, feel free to email me if you have new designs coming out, because honestly, it makes my life easier if people are sending me stuff and I'm not constantly searching. So I am never concerned with whether a designer is established or well known. I'm more concerned with, is this a good design that I'm happy to share and you know put my name behind? So yeah, I'm definitely happy to see new designers, especially when people come into the store, if they mention, oh, I'm buying this because I'm designing something, I always say, you know, email me, I wanna see it afterwards. So definitely. Right. What's your marketing strategy for the store? Like, especially with the COVID, I'm sure that didn't help. Like, how do you advertise your store? How do you make your name known? Um, so I'm going to be honest, I am always really surprised because people come to me and they say things like, oh, you have such a cohesive store brand and this and that. And how do you do it? And I'm like, I'm making it all up. I have no idea what I'm doing or what's going on. So I'm really glad it's working. So, um, you know, I wish I could say that I had some brilliant plan. I'm just kind of trying to be genuine and share the things that I'm excited about, uh, I spend a lot of energy on our newsletter. Uh, I guess one thing that I've learned it with you know, social media platforms is that 
you don't really own any of the platforms, right? Instagram can change it any minute. Facebook can change it any minute. But the thing that I own that's mine that sort of can't be taken away from me is my contact list, right? It's my email newsletter. And so I spend a lot of time thinking about, you know, what am I excited about? What can I get other people excited about? And what would I be happy to read, right? I, so I try to invest a lot of energy into making it inspiring. Most weeks, I'm trying to send out two newsletters every week. Sometimes I don't get around to it, but that is definitely where most of my effort goes in. But I am definitely not someone, like I did not have a marketing background going into this. And so a lot of times from the outside, people are like, oh, look at these things she's doing. She's got it figured out. I don't, like I'm you know, definitely making it up as I go. Um, well, when you mentioned the, your, your letter, um, what kind of information goes into that letter? Like what can people expect to find there? So you'll get information about upcoming workshops and events, and you'll get new product releases and you'll get, you know, pattern inspiration. I try and sort of have seasonally appropriate things you know like now we're getting into colder weather we're about to get into holiday season people are going to start gift knitting so they're going to be looking for smaller projects bulkier yarn you know in the summer i spend a lot of time trying to educate people about the fact that yes you do knit year round here's you know great things about linen and so i try to also include when i can things that are useful like links to tutorials or like helpful things so i try and you know have it be interesting and informative and not just like hey here's a thing to buy you know so you'll get but yeah so you'll get new product releases new pattern inspiration new and upcoming workshops and events and that kind of stuff who are the people who your customers are they like mostly in people who walk into the store or is it like mostly online business at this point well, because of COVID, that has changed a lot, right? Our business was definitely 90% in person pre-COVID. And then when we had to shut down, I, you know, I'm, I'm in sort of a unique situation as a yarn store owner. Not completely unique, but a lot of people who run yarn stores, um, you know, they do it as a hobby business or it's something that's, you know, it's just a little shop. There's not a lot of people who actually depend on their yarn shop, which I do. And so you know, some people, when they shut down, they just said, oh, you know, we'll reopen eventually, it doesn't matter. And I went into like overdrive and panic mode because I was like, well, I don't have that option. I still have to buy food. <laughs> and so I started focusing very, very heavily on our online side. And, you know, for obviously, like, you know, for about a year, 90% of our business was online. And now we've sort of reopened and it's starting to kind of balance out more but our online part has grown a lot and it's been really amazing because we have customers from literally all over the world now and our knit night moved to zoom uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. And you know, it's, I thought at some point we'd discontinue or cut back. And even when I suggested like, maybe we go down to every other week, people like rebelled. They were like, no, we need this. And so our online community, it, I think is now stronger than our, our local community. So it's actually like was uh, basically bonus, like a little bonus sort of push that you didn't. Yeah, it, I mean, I definitely don't want to say that there was anything good about the pandemic. It, you know, of course not. But it definitely forced me to try and make some jumps in the business that I wouldn't have done otherwise or that I wouldn't have thought possible. So it's definitely shifted things a lot in ways that I really appreciate. Do you feel like that's the lesson for you from that last couple of years that like you need to be flexible and adjust to whatever life throws your way. Oh and yeah, definitely. Slower. I mean, you know, it's a constant dance. I feel like every week, like there's some new challenge and you just have to be willing to shift and innovate because you know, the world's constantly changing. What are you going to do? Like I, I actually had been offering private online knitting lessons on my website for, I think like three years, just to see if anyone would ever take me up on it. And they never did, never before the pandemic. And you know, now it's a normal thing. So how do you balance your time now? Because it's like a lot of things changing, right? So you've moved to more doing more stuff online. You're more active in like writing those letters. I'm sure it takes tons of time to like just research stuff to put in those letters. Yeah. How do you balance your time? 
um, poorly. <laughs> Honestly. Um, I don't have great work-life balance. I will very openly admit that. But one of the things that I've sort of had to do is, you know, I've had to hire people, you know, like there's not really a way to sugarcoat that. But I was at a point, uh, you know, when we were looking at reopening where I was literally working all day and some days, some weeks, I wouldn't get to a newsletter because I was so busy packing orders. And then I'd get stressed out because like, oh, well, now new, new, new orders aren't coming in. Why? Oh, because even though I've been working like crazy, no one's heard from me online for however many days. And so I just started to realize that, you know, I was at a choke point because I literally couldn't work more hours. And then you get into that, you know, to talk about business here, you get into that place of like, well, I can't actually afford to hire anyone. I need to make more money. It's like, but I can't make more money because like, physics, you know, like there's not more hours in the day. And so I kind of just took a leap of faith and I have uh, four part-time employees now. And I just went into it saying, I'm just going to believe that this is going to make everything more efficient and it'll come back and it'll work out. And so far I'm okay, but it's really terrifying, honestly, but it's made a huge difference. Uh, you know, I have an amazing employee, Melanie, who's actually at my shop right now. So we can be here chatting and she's fantastic with people. She's an excellent knitter. You know, she's definitely been a great addition to the shop. Um, I have an employee, Annie, who is helping with digital content creation uh, because she has a photography background. And so you know, that's making all the difference. And so, you know, realizing how important it is to have a team that works well together makes all the difference. Right. So when people come to your store, what can they expect to find there? Like, is it all very easy to find your way around it? Or does somebody greet them and start showing them around on a tour? Like, how does that happen in your store? Uh, well, so when you come in, right, like it's sort of set up because, you know, we are in a tourist town. And so I wanted to be a parent to the people who aren't there for the yarn, that there is something for them, right? So when you walk in, the first thing you see is a table full of tarot decks. And then to the side, you have sort of our yarn that's, um, you know, sort of being featured. So like, you know, you'll walk in right now and you'll see a wall full of La Bienamie and spin, spin Cycle, which makes me very happy. And then you'll see all the, the tarot decks. Um, but generally, you know, I'll just say, hi, you know, let me know if you have any questions. And I give people a chance to walk around and, you know, see the space and let me know if they need help. I definitely don't, you know, preemptively offer a tour. Right. Yeah. So besides yarn and tarot decks, what else can they find in your store? Like, is there other things that you sell that's not necessarily strictly yarn? Yeah, well, so, you know, so the tarot decks kind of grew into just more overall witchy stuff. So, you know, we definitely have tumbled crystals, we have staining crystal points, we have uh, candles. I have a, well, she, now she's my friend, but she, um, Katie, Soy Much Brighter, uh, is not too far from us in her studio and she makes hand poured soy candles. So we have all her candles and she's also developed um, a bunch of custom scents for us. So you'll definitely find that, um, you know, we definitely have, you know, books, magazines and uh, embroidery kits and cross stitch kits too. So I try to have something that can appeal to everyone. And I think of embroidery kits as kind of like the gateway drug. So, you know, someone walks in and they're like, oh, I don't knit. Oh, but it looks like I could probably do this embroidery kit. And I'm like, yes, come to the fiber world, you know? <laughs> you consider this store like mostly for knitters or like, do you have a lot of people who crochet, who do other stuff that come in? It's definitely more for knitters. And the thing with crochet, it's kind of tough because, you know, I have gotten people say, oh, why don't you offer more stuff for crocheters? You know, I'm a crocheter and I say, well, because every time that I offer a crochet workshop, nobody shows up. Or every time that I offer a crochet thing, there's not really a response. And so there's kind of a, a catch 22 there where, you know, you don't offer a lot of crochet stuff. And so you don't get a lot of crocheters, but, you know, but if crocheters aren't showing up for the crochet stuff, you can't offer it. And so that's kind of been a puzzle that I haven't quite cracked. I wish that we had more crochet involvement but there's definitely a piece of the puzzle that I'm missing do you um like I so after I was interviewing Jacob who was the one who introduced us basically mm -hmm. um he was he used to design crochet pieces then he got into knitting and then mm -hmm. during our interview 
I asked him if he ever considered doing designs and knitting. And he was like, no, like I'm too busy with school. I'm not ready for that. And then a few days later, he shoots me a DM and goes, well, guess what you made me do? I'm working on my first knitting design, right? Yeah. He, he's like just about to publish this new head that he designed. Do mm-hmm. you do any... Um, courses on designing because you are a designer or do you encourage other people to try design or try to modify the patterns yeah so one of the classes that I teach that I really like is actually on sweater fitting and how to read schematics and understand how to modify a sweater to actually fit your body properly so that's something that I'm really really passionate about uh with Jacob specifically you know he's obviously he's my best friend and so, you know, like I tech edited the pattern for him before he sent it off. So I definitely try and support people kind of where I can. Um, I've also taught classes on shawl shapes and how to, you know, how to design shawls. I haven't done it in a while, but not for any reason in particular. I should probably get that on the schedule again. <laughs> right. Um, do you have like some, some sort of like longer term plan for the store? Do you have some sort of vision for like what else you want to do like things you want to change do you think about that are you too busy with like every day day to day running of the store you know I keep I keep hoping that one day I'll get to a point where I go oh I have a whole content calendar planned for the year as opposed to like oh crap that thing's next week I need to figure something out but unfortunately it's more of the latter but you know there is sort of a kind of general idea I think that I would love to keep growing online and really expand like doing more as far as education and pre-recorded workshops because I I think that that's really where my strength is and I want to be able to share that with more people but I've just found it really wonderful to see the online community grow and you know just really become a core part of what we're doing. And that's what I really want to keep growing. I've had people ask me if I'd ever open like a second store location. And that's not something that I'm really interested in. If anything, I'd want to have more, uh, you know, I, I guess I'd want a warehouse so that we can ship more, but I'm definitely interested in more connections with people all over the place rather than just local. Right. What's the social media for you? Like, how do you use it? How important it is for you did you find like your people online? I, I feel like I'm still trying to crack the Instagram code. Uh, that's definitely the platform that I use the most. And I still feel like there's some sort of like secret out there that I haven't quite cracked on it. But that's definitely been my most useful tool as far as meeting people. You know, like Rochelle Home Roof Fiber Co. is now one of my closest friends and I met her online. Uh, Ash Alberg there in Canada and they're one of my closest friends now too and I also met them online and so I would say that Instagram has been absolutely the most critical place but it's you know it's not the only space because on Facebook you know we have our shop Facebook group and that's a much more communal thing so I sort of have Instagram as a place where I can communicate uh, with other makers directly and then we have Facebook that allows you know for the community space to to happen. Right. When do you find time to knit out of all of that? Because I hear like a lot of things happening in your life, but I (laughs) like, I don't see the spot for when you can just sit there and relax and knit. Like, when does that happen? Uh, That does not happen as much as it used to, honestly. Um, But, you know, if I'm at the store and I'm, you know, I'm talking to someone, like I'm probably knitting as I'm talking to them. That's something that I've had to learn learn how to do is you know knit without looking at my knitting because I'm I'm there is really no time where I'm just sitting and knitting like I might be watching a webinar while I'm knitting or doing some other thing so it yeah I'm not getting as much knitting done as I wish I was these days do you ever look back and wish you just pursued architectural career like do you ever have any regrets about starting the store no None, absolutely not. Well, um, somebody and, came to you right now and said, well, I'm thinking of opening a store like three towns away from you. Like what would be your advice? Or would you try also, to tell them like, think about it twice before you jump in? 
I'm going to be honest. So I've had a lot of people come to me and say, hey, I'm thinking of buying this knitting shop. Should I do it? I always say, don't do it. I'm going to be honest. It's hard. It's really, really, really hard work. Um, it's not going to be a luxurious paycheck. And a lot of people have this idea that running a knitting shop means you get to have your cute little shop and you go in and you knit all day and sell some stuff and then you go home at the end of the day. And for some people that might be the case, right? Like if you are someone who has a significant other who is the breadwinner, you don't need to make money at your shop, it's just a leisure thing, then that's fine. Like that can be the dream. You just go in, you knit all day, you don't do much and people you know, come in or they don't and then you're done for the day. And that's one way to run a business. But if you're actually looking to be profitable, to actually be able to, you know, have employees, a lot of yarn shops don't have employees, right? It's just the owner. Um, then you're looking at a completely different animal and it's hard work. Um, you know, yarn does not necessarily have the same uh, profit margin that other types of products do, especially when you're working with indie companies. Generally, their wholesale margins are uh, even smaller than when you're working with big companies. So it's really, really, really hard work. Um, I remember I have this one memory burned into my head from Yarn Crawl a few years ago. Like, you know, we'd been frantically cleaning the store. We did all this stuff and then we were ready and we unlocked the door to wait for people. People hadn't shown up just yet. And I literally, I sat down and I picked up my needling needles for the first time, like all week. And someone walks in and says, oh, it must be so nice to just sit and knit all day for a living. <laughs> and, you know, like, <laughs> I don't know how I didn't just like dissolve into a pile of like crying and screaming when she said that. Cause I was like, that is not what I do all day. I do bookkeeping and marketing and customer service and I stock shelves and I clean the floors and I do this and I do that. And so, you know, I, I just want anyone who's thinking about it to really understand what that reality is like. Right. And be clear about what your business goals are. If you're going into it thinking this is going to be easy and I'm going to make a lot of money. No. That's definitely not the case. And so I have a friend who recently, um, well, actually, I guess it's just been about a year, but she bought a yarn store um, about like a half hour drive from where I am. And she reached out to me and she was like, oh, should I do it? Should I not? And I said to her, I was like, you're buying a store that she's selling because she's struggling to make ends meet in a pandemic. She's not selling because the business is doing well. It's gonna be hard. You're buying it during a pandemic. And I don't think it's a good idea. All that said, if you decide to do it anyway, like I'm here to support you, but I'm not going to lie about the difficulties. And, you know, of course she bought it anyway, and she's doing great, but I never want to give someone the impression that it's easy. It's not. When was the last time you went on vacation? Just closed the store and like went somewhere, ah. relax. <laughs> uh, <laughs> never? <laughs> I mean, I, yeah. Does that like bother you, stress you? Like, do you think about that? That like you sort of becoming slave to your business? Yes. And, you know, that's the thing too, right? If you're running a shop and you're, you know, like you're starting out with a small shop, you're probably not going to have money to hire people right away. And it means that you have to be there every day. It is really exhausting. It's really difficult. And you're going to have to be open weekends. And so, Yes, I definitely kind of got to a point where I was starting to feel captive. And that's where I had to make some decisions about the direction that I wanted the business to go in. And so I hired help. And, you know, so I'm not at the shop as much myself anymore. But it means that I have to be outside of the shop doing things that are generating revenue so that I can afford to not be at the shop. And so that's definitely tough. Um, I am actually going to travel in about a week and a half, I'm going to fly back to Brazil to see my family. Um, and I'm a little nervous, but it's going to be okay. <laughs> it's going to be okay. So you offer tarot reading on, online, right? Like you, mm -hmm. anybody can book a session with you. Yeah. Do you, so like your life sounds stressful. Like you have so much running through your mind. Like you have to balance all those things. And then you're offering that as well. Like, do you feel like it's like tipping the scale? Like, do you have to have some like peace of mind to go into to reading? Because it's, it just takes so much energy out of you to do a reading. You know, it's funny because I actually had a tarot reading last night. And one thing that I've noticed is that inevitably 
the days that people book me for a tarot reading are always the days where I like didn't sleep well and I'm super strung out and I'm running around. And I, I guess I feel like that's sort of part of the, the challenge, right? Of being someone who's gonna offer those kinds of services is I have to be able to step into that space and go, all right, this isn't about me anymore, shutting that off. And so I've definitely had to learn some really good, you know, sort of internal boundaries to be able to like shift my mind quickly like that. Right. I know like part of the, there is this whole concept of witchcraft, right? So like, I'm, we're not talking about boiling little children in the cookie hole, house, <laughs> whatever. I'm talking about yeah. like putting intent into like what you're doing like may bringing like part of you putting a part of you into what you're creating like is that part of your dying process like when you do that do you feel like you're putting a part of yourself into your yarn yeah definitely I mean you know there's a lot of witchcraft in knitting if we think about it because you know that's what you're saying when you're when you're doing witchcraft and doing magic it's about you know setting intents and for and one of uh, the more traditional forms of doing magic is doing knots where you're like thinking of something and making wishes and putting knots into a cord and knitting is literally like making knots over and over right and so every like when you're sitting there and you're knitting and all the things that you're thinking like you're knitting that into your into your project right so I would say like if you're really mad don't like knit really angrily and then like gift that to someone you know like all that like angry energy and so I definitely try and have that mindfulness into, you know, what I'm doing. And I'm trying to encourage folks to think of it that way too. You know, like I have a knitting kit right now, that's also a spell kit. And so like I have a meditation that goes along with the knitting, you know, to try and get people to think about it in those terms too. Do you ever teach like mindfulness and meditation? I have, uh, I've taught classes on how to, uh, trigger what's called an alpha state so now I'm going to start sounding a little a little nerdy here but bear with me and so you know when we're fully awake our brain waves work at a certain speed right that's called uh, generally a beta state and then when you start daydreaming and you start meditating your brain waves actually like literally slow down like when you zone out while knitting or while driving or while exercising your brain kind of you know loses focus on other stuff it becomes very focused and your brain waves actually slow down into an alpha state and that's considered to be, you know, really beneficial. Uh, even in like the Marine Corps, they teach you how to do something called square breathing that helps slow down your brain waves. So there's a lot of benefits to it. And so I have taught classes on, you know, different ways to get your brain waves to slow down in that meditative state. And knitting is definitely something that works for that. It's repetitive motion in general. Like if we think about spiritual practices and how people do ritual, uh, there's a lot of commonalities, right? Like dim lights, candles, chanting, dancing, repetitive motion. And that's because the human brain responds to that, right? When the lights dim, it does something to your brain space. Like it signals like, oh, something different's happening. Like I'm breaking away from, you know, from the day to day. And so, you know, those are things that can, like we can use these external triggers to help our brain waves slow down. And so knitting can definitely be that for people. Right. I also like when you mentioned that you had like somebody develop a uh, sense for the store specifically, like I know that part of the uh, reaching is all the herbs, like the sage burning and what have you. Like, do yeah. you add anything to the store from like that side, any like essential oils, anything like? Well, so, you know, so the, the sense that I've created for the store, generally, if I remember to light a candle, we're burning one of those, but the way that those came to be, like, for example, we have a um, set of, we have three sort of spell candles that are called circle, spark, and crown, and circles for protection, spark is for inspiration, crown is for like self-empowerment and sovereignty, and how those came to be is I you know, did my research on, you know, like here's herbs that would be used in spells for these things. And then I gave the list of herbs to Katie and I said, you know, here's a list of herbs, which ones can you combine to create a good scent? And then, so she'd say, oh, this and this will go well together. And so there's definitely a whole process of like, you know, being very intentional about what's ending up in there. And then we definitely, you know, burn those in the store. Right. How do you take care of yourself? Like what's the way you would treat yourself that you would feel like cherished them? I like getting massages. 
honestly. That's the thing that I've decided is like, I deserve that. And I beat my body up a whole lot, you know, <laughs> hauling boxes of yarn all over the place. And so I've reached a point in my life where I'm like, you know what? I can get a massage once a month. Like, that's okay. I can have like an hour and a half where nobody talks to me and someone just massages me. Right. What's like your least favorite thing about running a store? So my favorite thing about running a store is people. My least favorite thing about running a store is people. (laughs) 99% of people are wonderful, but it is very difficult to work in a service industry and customer service can be really, really tough. And sometimes there's someone who, you know, most of the time when someone comes in and they're picking a fight with us, it's not because we've done anything, they're having their own issues and we become sort of, you know, we are on the receiving end of it and being put in a position where someone is mistreating you, but you're supposed to be professional and you can't do anything about it feels really terrible and that's sometimes the kind of thing that completely derails your entire day and you just feel completely drained of energy and that can be really tough but 99 percent of people are absolutely lovely <laughs> right. well how do you snap out of it how do you pick yourself up and like continue with the business and don't say you know what i've had enough i'm gonna think of something else to do now you mean when i've had a difficult conversation with someone um I don't have a good answer to that because I ruminate about it all day and I feel terrible about it all day and I torture myself with it. So I am not the one who has good advice for that. If anyone does, I would love to hear it. (laughs) I don't have a good answer. Well, when customers complain, like, is it usually about uh, quality of materials? Like what can they possibly dislike so much? So... A tough thing with knitters who are less experienced is that they will do something like knit to the wrong gauge. And instead of realizing that, they'll be like, well, you sold me the wrong amount of yarn. And I'm like, no, the gauge is wrong, you know? And so that tends to be kind of where issues come up. But honestly, the biggest issue ends up being with policy. Someone will come in and be like, I got this a year ago and I want to return it. And I'm like, no, <laughs> you know? Right. And that tends to be the biggest point of contention is, um, you know, being in for like holding the line with your policies because people take it really personally. You know, I can't make exceptions for everybody because then we go out of business. But when I'm telling one specific person, no, you can't return this. And they're going like, well, you should make an exception for me. In my head, I'm going, I can't make an exception for 200 of you. But the other person on their end, they're just thinking like me, I'm not getting what I want. And that's really difficult right have you ever purchased yarn or anything for the store and regretted it yes and it was when I was trying out that advice of buy 30 percent ugly and so I bought some lines of yarn that I didn't really like but I kept telling myself well but someone else will and then every time someone came into the store and asked for yarn I would literally ignore that one because I wasn't excited about it and so you know, it's not that there was anything wrong with the yarn. I just, I cannot feign excitement over something that I'm not excited about. Like in a way, I'm actually a really terrible salesperson because I don't try and sell people things that they don't need. I don't, you know, I don't try and kind of upsell. I've talked people out of stuff when they're looking at buying something. And I'm like, you know, this is not a great idea because of this and that. Like I talk myself out of sales, but on the other hand, you know, people trust me because they know that I'm not just going to try and sell them stuff that they don't need but that's when I learned like even if other people are really passionate about something if I don't like it I always end up regretting buying it because I just can't get behind it in the way that I should right when people come like if if it's a tourist let's say that just came to Salem to look at the witches you know the museum and whatever the spooky houses yeah they come to your store do they not take you seriously like as a tarot reader or do they think it's all fake like what sense do you get when you do tarot reading we get all sorts you know some people come in never having having had a tarot reading and feeling super skeptical about it other people come in just sort of being afraid of witches and tarot and so they come in sort of being very very afraid um 
Like I actually had someone a couple days ago, bless her heart, she came in and she was just buying one of our candles. She goes, is this a Wicca candle? Oh, no, actually she says, she says, oh, is this just a normal candle? And I was like, as opposed to what? She goes, oh, as opposed to a Wicca candle. And I was like, oh yeah, it's just a normal candle. She's like, oh, she said, I'm very superstitious. And I'm just like, it's soy in a wick, like calm down. <laughs> <laughs> not gonna bite right and I've also seen um, across the street from me so I can see them through my window there is you know like a proper witch store and I see people like bless themselves and do all sorts of things before walking in there and I'm like you know it's just a store right and so but we all on the other hand we get the people who are super interested in that kind of stuff and so you know you definitely get a whole spectrum well educate out my audience about the reading like what can they expect during the reading if they during were during a tarot reading well so I definitely wouldn't say that everyone does them the same way but I think that for me the biggest sort of misconception is that people go into it thinking oh it's fortune telling it's going to tell me who my future husband is or whatever and that's not the approach that I take and I find that that tends to not be accurate and tends to be more for show because you know I believe that we are creatures with free will nothing's predetermined so that's not really what it's for um, I see it more as a way to offer guidance and help people through um, issues. So uh, the, the way that I always say it is, you know, tarot doesn't ever really tell you something that you don't know, but it helps you face the things that maybe you didn't want to accept about a situation, right? So when we're pulling cards, we're talking about, you know, sort of here's the big energies that are happening in your life, you know, like the big cycles that you need to think about, you know, here's some situational information um, about, you know, a a particular struggle you might be having or a relationship and so it's really more about trying to offer guidance in that sense it's definitely not like the mystical like you know like I'm not gonna be holding a skull when you come in and going, Ooh, you know <laughs> well you offer two different times right you offer half an hour and then the full hour, hour yeah the full hour like what's the difference like how much more information will one hour gain you well you know, a lot more because it gives you time to get more in depth into the issues, but also, you know, as we are going through a reading, you know, it's generally a conversation with me and the other person. It's not just me sort of talking at them. And so, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll go through some of the cards and I'll be like, you know, what questions do you have? What do you want to know more about? And so we build on that. And so you definitely can tackle a lot more in an hour than in half an hour, but half an hour, I still think is a good amount when we're doing them in person. We also offer 15 minute increments and that just tends to be a really quick check-in. Um, but, you know, I, half an hour is definitely enough, you know, an hour gets really in depth. Do you ever do readings for yourself? Um, not so much. I mean, for small things, yes, but I'm really good at arguing with myself and I'm not very good at being objective in things that are about me. And so like, you know, I'm going to pull some cards and it's going to tell me what I don't want to hear. And I'm going to like argue with it. And so <laughs> I will usually call on a friend to read for me if I have something that I really need help with. You know, I'm, I'm just in my life in general, I'm way better at helping other people than myself. Right. Well, if you had to choose between a tarot reading or knitting class, like the same amount of time, same pay, what would be your preference? Like if I was paying for something? No, if you were teaching, like what, what, what do you prefer? That's a really tough question. Hmm. Well, I like teaching tarot more than I like doing readings. And, and when I say more, it's just, it's just a kind of a different satisfaction, but being able to, you know, teaching tarot to a group of people, I sort of feel like I've given a bunch of people at once tools, whereas a one on one reading, I'm just talking to one person. So there's kind of a different level of satisfaction there. But you know, sometimes the readings can be really intense and really emotionally cathartic for people and they're really special too. So I don't know, that's tough. I guess I just enjoy doing that kind of, you know, exchange with people regardless. Right. Well, I hope I didn't tire you out today completely. No. <laughs> <laughs> and I loved having you over as a guest of my channel. Thank you so well, much. Thank you so much. <laughs> and I, it was lovely to meet you in person because now I feel like I sort of know you. So one day soon I'm coming to Salem and I'll stop by and say hi. Yeah, you'll have to visit me and Jacob. <laughs> totally. Well, thank you so much.